one fall, I think, what, three weeks ago, right? And it just so happened that I was in India visiting many different conferences, and I just had exactly the vacancy today that I didn't have any programs. So I just fitted in perfectly. So I thought it was a divine intervention of some sort. Anyhow, so I would like to talk about uh, the research of Muslim Nanakor. This is an institute that I founded about 10 years ago when I uh, left the United States for several reasons. One was because I was pretty disgusted with the re-election of George Bush, but now he looks like an angel to me. <laughs> Now he looks, you know, like completely different. But anyway, the point of the matter is that uh, I also wanted to found something like a think tank, like a mini bell lab. And so this is kind of the, we were funded extremely generously by the Singapore government, as well as the National University of Singapore. And so, so this is kind of like a dream institute for me. Now here, I want to show you the map of Singapore. Uh, and if I, this is the map of the Southeast Asia, and uh, Oh yeah, that's right. No, no. They... Oh, I see. Uh, so what were you using? Were you using computer? <laughs> what? Very convincing job. <laughs> I thought you were going. Anyhow, so the, if I if I you know if I do a pin the donkey on this map and say you know blindfold pin your uh, thing on the Singapore. It'll be almost a, uh, a one, one chance in a billion that you'll see Singapore on this map. It's, it's a little dot at the tip of Malaysia. It's a real dot. It's like the size of a period on this, uh, on this map. Okay? So it's really small. So to really give a comparison, this is the area of India versus the area of Singapore. Okay? So India is about 3.3 million square kilometers. Singapore is uh, yeah, you know, less than 1,000 times the area. It's 792 square kilometers. So it's really interesting because it's like one quarter the size of New Jersey. So if you speed too fast, you just fall into the sea in Singapore. You have to be careful because, you know, <laughs> it's a nano country, okay? So the convincing reason why they need nanotechnology because, you know, they need to survive. Okay, so I would like to say this is my laboratory, but it isn't. It's the picture of Singapore from Marina Bay Sands. It's a very high-tech city, and my daughter said that. This city looks just like uh, Disneyland, big Disneyland. You know? so, because it's so clean and whatnot. And just, so I kept asking him, why don't you want to come and live in Singapore? And she said, no, it's like living in Disneyland. Okay, now this is our laboratory. It's, a, it's called a key building in which there are roughly about six institutes, five or six institutes. And since I had the choice of the, the space in the building first, I picked the penthouse, which is on the 11th floor. Because I would have preferred the basement, but they put a car park in the basement, so I figured that, okay, let me get the best view with me. So that's where we are. Uh, now, um, we work on a number of programs which are extremely well funded, typically in the range of about $10 million per five years or so. So our limitation is not uh, financial resources, but more human resources. So we're working on quantum interfaces, like trying to see how can they control interfaces to create new properties in the field? Then we are also working on low energy memories, and I'm going to say a few words about that. In my, I'll be dedicating roughly about a third of my talk on memory. Uh, then um, beyond more, uh, that is, you know, beyond more, basically the silicon CMOS. What are the alternatives to that? Okay. So we are working on offset electronics on silicon. That is a very interesting problem because oxygen electronics have been around for the last 25 years and it isn't really commercially going anywhere. So our feeling is that only if you integrate it with silicon, it has a, any kind of a chance. Okay? So that is the reason for the concept. Then plasmonic interconnects is a very, very interesting problem because plasmonics is a, is a field in which you can make photonic devices that, are, that scale with semiconductor devices. Conventional photonic devices like modulators, you know, light sources and detectors are very large. They're typically microns to you know, hundreds of microns dimension. Whereas the semiconductors are approaching, you know, basically a two nanometer dimension. Basically. So the two devices don't scale. On the other hand, in plasmons, what we do is we actually combine the photons and the electron properties on the surface of matter, and this, this. Uh, the propagating 
last one, which is a very interesting quantum that you can beat with, and you can use that potentially for communicating across the chip. Okay. The problem with the speed has been the fact that plasma sources and plasmonic detectors have been very large, <coughs> but you use an external laser to generate the plasma and use a PI and detector to measure the plasma. Whereas what we now discovered at uh, NUS is an MIM junction can efficiently launch plasmons, very efficiently, and the MIM junction can be you know, scaled down to nanometer scale. And the same MIM junction operated in rivers can also detect the plasma. So we've recently been funded to do plasmonic in impact analysis, which is a very interesting project. We're also working on carbon dioxide conversion. So the idea here is we would like to essentially take the excess power that we power plants essentially dump at night. Basically, a, a power plant has to generate more more power than the peak demand just to make sure that you know the system doesn't collapse at the peak demand. And then at night they basically you know dump a lot of the power. And dumping the power actually costs money and is also wasting resources. But if I can take that power, even at a less of an efficiency, convert them into say chemical energy by converting them, say for example, if I have a power plant next to a uh, factory that has a large CO2 effluent, and I can convert the CO2 into you know, something like you know, uh, you know, ethylene or fire oil, organic products, then you can actually store these you know, chemicals and that would be like uh, essentially uh, a chemical conversion of energy that we are basically. So we are actually working on very interesting uh, strategies Make this happen. Then the next project is on uh, energy, sustainable energy solutions for Internet of Things. And this is becoming very interesting because the big emphasis today is on smart cities, smart buildings. I mean, little did we know till now that we've actually been living in dumb buildings and dumb cities. Okay? But anyway, the point of the matter is we are now going to move into smart cities and smart buildings. So if you think of a smart building, let's say if you take this hotel and you want to make it a smart building, then we will have to have thousands of sensors, and these sensors will be put in totally inaccessible places where you can't reach them, okay? So how do you power them? You can't be running wires all over this place because this entire building looks like a cobweb, basically, you know? So you have to power them some other way, and you can't be running batteries either, which will basically, you know, nobody's gonna go replace all of them in different parts of the building. So the idea is to have, you know, so energy, you know, it's, uh, essentially devices that will energy harvest. So there are a number of schemes for how devices can harvest energy from the environment. Say for example, temperature differences, building vibration, and various other uh, schemes that are there. So that's one area that we're working on. Now, this is my pet project. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I went to Singapore was to do uh, bi biology related work. And we're looking at bio inorganic interfaces where we find that we can actually certain oxides, you know, enhance cell growth and certain oxides inhibit cell growth. You know, fibroblast cell, which is a common cell in our body, if you put them on something like a surface like yttrium oxide, it just refuses to grow on the surface, you know. Whereas on zirconium oxide, next to the periodic table, you know, they, they grow like gangbusters. So they really, you know. So why? Why does this happen? You know, it's an addition problem. And why, why, did, why do the cells adhere to this versus not different surfaces? And this has actually got tremendous implications. And let's say, you know, biological implants, for example, you know, that I want to have a permanent implant, then I would like to have cells grow rapidly on the implant surface so that there are no regions where bacteria can grow, all right? But if I have a temporary implant, which I want to remove, we don't want the cells to grow on the surface. So you, you can see in both cases, you have interesting applications, self, you know, inhibiting surfaces so that's, that's what they enhance the surfaces. So there are many other, there are also this, uh, we also have programs on uh, nano drug delivery and we're using, you know, physics techniques like surface plasma resonance to actually, you know, quantify, you know, numerically how many, you know, molecules they're loading on a nanoparticle and how do you prevent the nanoparticle from adhering to proteins from the plasma, which essentially kills all nanoparticles. I mean, today what's happening is nanodrug delivery has been around for 20 years or 25 years, and you know, we all, all have this image of the people with nanobots running around and 
shooting killers and this and that, right? You know, but it never really happened. You know, we haven't really seen a commercial application of these nanotrust babies. And part of the reason is you take these millions of dollars of research and design a nanoparticle, it's got all the targeting drugs and this and that on it. You put it in your bloodstream, the plasma proteins immediately come in color of your, your nanoparticle. And gone is your million dollar nanoparticle. These plasma proteins have no reference for how much money you're putting in this these nanoparticles. You know, it's So this effect is called corona. Okay? And so, how do you treat the corona? Okay, so this is a, it's a big, big issue. So, what you want to do is you want to take a nanoparticle, make it look like a hairbrush. So, there's minimal surface area for proteins to stick on, and there are lots of schemes, like, you know, you see polyethylene glycol, you use these things, and you stick them on top of the nanoparticle, they look like hairbrush and so on. But then you want to find things that are biologically new to the system. And so, it's a pretty active area of research, okay? So, but, what we are doing is actually bringing in, you know, techniques that use as physicists to do these things so that we can be very quantitative. Because biologists, you find, tend to go the empirical route, try and try and try and different things, right? And physicists want to know, okay, what is the activation? What is the addition activation? So we got to get all these numbers out, otherwise we feel totally restless, you know? So we get all these things by this technique, you know, these are knowledge. The last project we're working on is called Prathomy, and this is a very, very exciting, exciting project, which I think is the way of the future. Our human breath contains roughly, we produce about 3,000 volatile organic compounds. We are actually a chemical factory. I don't know whether you realize it or not. That's why every one of us smells different, actually. Then someone opens their mouth, they're, you know, you want to run away. Some people, you just want to come very close to them. I don't know. You know, bottom line is, you know, VOCs are very interesting. They're very people dependent. And why is that? Because we, we are a biochemical system, and therefore, the various organic compounds that we generate are reflecting of the status of our health. So if you have certain diseases, then certain types of molecules are enhanced. So the molecular fingerprint is, uh, there's a correlation between your molecular fingerprint and the disease. Okay? So we have, you know, now, you know, as physicists, you know how to measure, you know, molecules. So these are all at parts per billion level. Okay? So, when you have a disease, a particular molecule will be enhanced by, a set of molecules will be enhanced by, you know, parts of three orders of magnitude, and so you want to measure that. Now, this is very interesting because the, the, we are already been working in this area. We are now able to tell by looking at the molecular pattern, there are if I get six different lung cancer cell lines, which are small cell, large cell, uh, lung cancer, it, when, we, when we talk about cancer, there's such a diversity of the uh, various cancer cells, right? So we can actually tell the difference between the different cells, which cells are producing what molecular, which is very encouraging. Secondly, in human studies, what we're finding is that if you took a population of uh, people with lung cancer and normal patients, we actually were able to completely separate out the lung cancer patient from the normal patient. And in the process, we found out that there's another separate group of data that was coming out. And later, we, we worked backwards and figured out that there were tuberculosis patients. So we can actually tell two TB patients from lung cancer patients from normal patients. So the issue then is this is using a mass spectrometer that's about the size of the, the black box out there, that's about the size of that. It could be used in a doctor's office, yeah, definitely. But what we really want eventually is a portable device, like an iPhone that I can breathe into it, and then you know, I'll be able to see a reading in terms of how active your disease is, so that you can adjust your drug you know, according. You don't want to overdrug yourself, because most of the cancer drugs are very toxic. So you want to just get the right amount to balance out if you're actually able to so that, those are the various things that we're working on. And in order to make these, these uh, handheld devices, we are working on what are called metasurfaces, optical metasurfaces. So I'm collaborating with uh, a large group at NIST and uh, in Gatesburg. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make thin film resonators, which are designed for mid, the mid-infrared for specific molecular resonance. Okay, so you know, this will be one way by which we can actually measure chips that will be you know, sensitive. So, you know, that sort of in a nutshell gives you an idea of the various programs. So in my today's talk, I'm really going to focus on uh, essentially 
The fourth place is just a composition process, which is kind of my signature contribution to the field of research, and then something about memories. So I'll focus on these three different topics, just to give you a flavor of the research that we are doing. Okay? Now, so the box, I want to give you some idea. This is a field that started in my lab in 1987. And uh, so the name, now that I've named it, of the deposition, I have regrets about it, because many people think we are actually depositing lasers. But it's not. We're not depositing lasers. We're using a laser to deposit films, OK? So the name kind of like stuck. And so that's where we are. So what we do is, let's say you want to make a very complicated material, like yttrium, barium, copper, calcium, you know, you know strontium oxide, you know, which is a mouthful. And I want to make a film of this stuff, right? And it's very, very difficult to do so. However, what happens is you can make a stoichiometric pocket of this material. This anybody can, because all you need to do is like we make uh, masala in the kitchen. You know, you put a little uh, crucible. We had a you know teaspoon of this, weight of this. You measure quantities of different things, and then you can mix them all up, and you can actually make a very nice stoichiometric pocket by heat centering, and you get a nice little. Then you put it in the laser beam under the right condition. It's a pulse laser, and it does develops, delivers energy to the surface, and the material that you cut in the form of a film that evaporated material exactly preserves the composition of the target. So this turned out to be a huge discovery we made in 1987. And, and because of this discovery, the field of oxides has just exploded since that time. And, you know, and uh, so what I did was I, I used to work at Bell, Bell during this invention. And so after I, I made the discovery, I uh, went and formed a company called Neocera. Yes. So I thought that it, the reason was I told my managers at Bell that we really need to make a big investment in oxide. They were not listening to me. So I figured, OK, if they're not going to do it, then I'm going to do it myself. So I went and formed this company. And then, then the Bell management had a big headache on that. So what do they do with me now? You know, because I'm now actually violating the company law that nobody can have a private company. So I kind of like took a chance and did it anyway. So the chairman of the company said, OK, thank you. So, you know, we, you know, we don't know what to do here, but I think what we're thinking is we, is the whole board decided that they're going to make you an intrapreneur. That means we're going to have your company, you're going to also work for us, and uh, we will have some cross licensing agreement and all this sort of stuff. And so why don't you go to our lawyers and work out a contract with yourself? Man, after that meeting, I, I actually went to that meeting and going to get a public flogging. But then, after this, I came out walking like in cloud nine. And then, I completely underestimated the state and go work with our lawyer to get the contract. That's, that was a key sentence, which I underestimated. So, that, the, then I had to work with a lawyer of my own from Manhattan. And so, the, the day I went to park my car in Manhattan, it was $37 an hour parking. In the parking lot. <laughs> Gives you an idea of what now you're dealing with, okay? So the lawyers come and say, oh, hey, don't worry, you know, we'll take care of you. You know, I'm a senior partner, I charge only four fifty an hour, my junior partner I do charge is only three fifty, no problem. We'll use him as much as possible. This guy three fifty, two years out of college, but I had in it anyway, just we went to this. So dealing with Bell Lab lawyers turned out to be a huge headache for me because they decided right up front that they're not going to make this happen because they saw me as a potential problem for them in the future. So I'm going to bring many, many more complications in their life. They had a cushy life and they didn't want to. So they just kept giving me problem after problem. And after a year of spending a huge amount of money from my pocket, the process wasn't going to Finally, I quit. I quit Bell. I went to the University of Maryland as a professor. I took my company. Okay, so that's the story about that company. Now let's talk about what what makes this process work. The first way the deposition process works because it's non-equilibrium thermal evaporation, and this is essentially this is an example of the first deposition that we made, in which we actually got reproduced a composition of a high PC superconductor: yttrium one, barium two, copper three, oxygen, and this is what's called a Rutherford backscattering spectrum, and it's just it, experiment was actually done in air. I mean, literally done in air, where we put, you know, the, the a carbon foil on which the material was deposited. Mm. So this is really possible. Then uh, what we found was that when we looked at the angular dependence of this definition, we noticed that there were two components to it. That 
that there is a strongly forward directed component, and then there's a, a shallow component which is shown in the dashed line, which is the cosine theta component, and that, that is the conventional evaporation, where the forward directed component is your actually what is called a non equilibrium you know, forward directed evaporation. We look below it, the compositions are shown, and you can see that the copper ACM ratio is three, only in the forward directed angle, and varying the trim is two, and copper variance is essentially with the you know, 1.5, which is exactly what you expect. But at the other angle, the larger angle, the composition is completely off. So this was actually the real invention that the specific angle is the TPR the material. And therefore, the aim of this is you have to work with the energy density of the laser such that you maximize this power directed component. For example, a half a joule per centimeter squared, you can sort of see mostly the cosine theta component dominate. The forward component is very small. This is the, the last one that the right most curve. And look beneath it, you see the compositions are way off. Whereas look, the extreme left at 1.1 joule per centimeter squared, very strong forward component, and then you see the ratios are three to three to one in that angle. So there's this lot of these ideas in terms of how to manage the PLD process we kind of you know follow after we did this measurement. And there are also uh, when I look at most of the PLD systems in India, they they do not scan the beam correctly. So I don't know how many PLD users are in this audience, but so I thought I'll include this just in case. And that has to do with how you scan the beam. If you do not scan, there's a very special way to scan the beam. And if you just scan the beam as I, as I've shown here two problems happen. One is that, you see, at the center of the disk, the rotation speed is very, very, you know, the laser beam is staying there for a longer time than on the edge where the velocity is, you know, the linear velocity is larger towards the edge. And therefore, the material itches slowly at the edge, whereas at the center it itches faster. So it develops your target. And therefore, the power directed component now is changing the angle. It goes away from your substrate. So this is a big problem. And second problem is because the laser is coming from an angle, any shadowing causes surface uh, roughness enhancement. So the surface becomes very, very rough, looks like this. And everyone has to take the target after every deposition. They sand it down. But these, the, these roughnesses produce particles in the film. Okay, so develop a novel scanning technique, which is very different, which scans over the whole substrate. And once we do that, essentially the target is like this. Ultra smooth, very, very thin. The target looks like a mirror, so you don't have to do things. You, know, uh, you don't have to polish it, up, and the film come out with very thin particles. So, now this is actually, uh, since a nano conference, the, I want to show you how this is related to nanotechnology because th this is a pulse laser deposition, molecular beam actual system, and with this we can actually deposit a conic layer of film. So, here, for example, the PLD deposited film of barium titanate on starch and ruthenate, and this is a TM image, and you can sort of see these are atomically ordered, you know, images. So you can see the starch and ruthenate underneath, and right at the edge where the arrow comes in is where barium titanate starts, okay? So these are beautiful atomic crystals that we're making, and so the, the you know, the, the bright dot to bright dot spacing is roughly four angles long. You can also make completely new materials that don't exist in nature. Here, for example, is one atomic layer of calcium oxide, in, and then another one, you put another calcium oxide, then you put strontium oxide, strontium oxide. So this material doesn't exist in nature, but you can create something like this, and now you can start to do what's called block by block, growth of oxide, and create totally new material that didn't exist in nature. Now, there's another invention that we have, it's called the pulse electron dump where the laser is a very big object, where you can replace the laser with something that is really small, which is roughly about a you know, foot and a half in size, this, this pulse electron. And this electron uh, being a hit on the target also generates a very beautiful film, and you can use this to deposit film. And so here is the size comparison. So you see the PED system on the left looks like this, the laser looks like um, much bigger. So the laser is replaced by something which is roughly, you know, one over 58 times its size. This is, this is one of the recent advancements. Now, now the big emphasis is PLD today is in uh, diagnostics, and we are working on ion energy spectrometers, which can measure the ion energy in the, the, the plume 
which is very important for determining the quality of the films that they're making. Then, to measure the crystallinity on the, the actual lattice constant, we use what are called reflection high energy electron diffraction. So you can sort of see this grid. Uh, you essentially have a, a beam coming into the system, which is an electron beam, which bounces off of the substrate, and then this electron diffracts, and we, and we can actually measure these oscillations, which are shown in red there. And these oscillations represent one unit cell growth. So every unit cell growth corresponds to one peak. And therefore, we can actually make grow a film, which is like tenth of a monolayer in thickness, which is incredible accuracy. And you see the read diffraction patterns are shown in the photograph in the, in the middle. And that gives you the lattice constant. So we said, OK, we can get the lattice constant of the film. I can get the, I can get the thickness of the film. How to get the composition of the film? That would be really incredible if I can do it in situ. So what we did is we actually look at an electron beam strikes a surface, generate X-ray. So 10 years ago, uh, Colin Wood in the Navy, he said, OK, we're going to develop a technology to convert this electron beam induced X-ray into composition measurement. So he funded a large number of scientists all over the USA. At the end of it, they all came back and said, it's impossible. We can't do it. You know, basically, electron beam goes hits everyone in the chamber. There's too much background stuff that can't be done. So this is a very rigid sign. So in my company, we had a Russian guy, you know, Mikhail Spoykovsky, whom I hired from Novos to his lab because I heard about this guy. And he was a very, very smart person, very low key, but very smart. So I knew that, and I hired him in the company. And so I told him, look, why don't you go solve this problem? You know, you guys can't solve it, but I think you're really smart, so you'll really solve it. And he came up with a beautiful solution for this. I'm going to show you some of the data. So this is a system. It's called Lac Luang Loop X-ray spectroscopy, and this system actually measures the composition as a film is being made. So you see, this is the, the red line in the middle is the X-ray that comes out, and the peaks on it are actually characteristic X-ray peaks of the elements. And we developed an algorithm which can essentially measure the composition. For example, I'll give you a comparison. As the film is growing, in, in about 10 nanometers, we measure the composition. So here is lanthanum, 0.78, calcium, 0.32, MnO, or whatever. We send this, the film later to Rutherford Park there. He goes to California. Two weeks later, we get the result back. Exactly the same composition. Lanthanum, 0.67, calcium, whatever. We reproduce the composition. This, this is a tremendous breakthrough in film deposition. But what this means is, since I can measure the composition and growing the film, now I can have a feedback process. And I can tailor and change the film as I'm growing. Okay? So my dream in 10 years' time is like this. You'll be sitting in front of a deposition system, and you'll type it. I want a film which has got transparency of 10%. I want its conductivity to be such and such. Okay? And I want the thickness to be so and so. And then the computer goes into a library. And this library actually has in it data from, you know, thousands and thousands of published papers, and there's an artificial intelligence program which will take my command and immediately do a quick matching and it'll come back to me with, or did you try AX, BX, CX, whatever it is, and give me a competition, right? Give me a couple of alternatives. And I pick one of them. And then inside the machine, there's a little robotic arm, and all the different periodic table objects are stored inside. And it just goes fix whatever I want, fix it, and makes a film that I want. And you get exactly the film that you want to properly. That is my dream. So that's why we are heading towards it. OK. So next I want to go into the next topic, which is called uh, the next topic. Both of them are related to memories. OK. So you all remember what memories are. OK. It's actually devices that we use for storing information. OK. So if you take your laptop, OK, we, we all get frustrated when I use my laptop and the power is draining out and it says, and you're perfectly searching for a safe place to plug your computer, no plugs available, and there you are, you know, the computer is dying out. Okay, what is causing this death of your power? 25% of it is the memories that are responsible in a laptop, okay? Now, if you go to a server station, okay, server stations are very important because they suck up the energy of huge communities. You go to Silicon Valley, between Google, between Facebook, and all these guys, the service stations basically take up like 
20-30% of the energy produced in the Philippine plant. Literally, you know, that's the energy consumption. And their energy lo the, the losses are 50% in memories. Because they have large memory net. So you can sort of see, if I reduce the efficiency of a memory by a factor of two, just two, right? It's a huge savings in it, right? So this is the whole impetus behind, you know, you want to reduce, you know, produce memories that have low energy consumption. Now, our approach has been to use ferroelectric as a way to reduce oxide memory energy. So there are what are called tunneling electro-resistance is one effect that we're going to use and I'm going to let me show you how it works. Okay. So this is a tunneling electro-resistance device. I'm going to show you two different examples. Okay. There is a film of barium titrate on the left, which is the kind of a brown film. On top of it, there are cobalt metal uh, deposited. And then on the right-hand side, essentially, you have uh, a, 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 a strong, plasma strontium magnet the conducting oxide. Then there's the barium titrate ferroelectric, which is a thin red line. And then on top of it, there is a metal element. Okay. So what happens is when you look at the resistance of this device as a function of voltage, you see it has two resistive states given by this hysteresis curve. Okay. And this has to do with the polling of the directly. If the directly is pulled one way, you get one resistance, pull the other way, you get the other resistance. And these on-off ratios of the resistance in the last 10 years being like a global race, everyone trying to make bigger and bigger on operation for the resistance. So the numbers have gone from something like 10 or a few percent to today is almost like a million percent. Just been crazy things going on. And what they found was that every time someone introduced a new interface there, we got an increase in the uh, on operation. So we decided to sort of look at this a little bit more carefully in our measurement. So we make three different types of device structure. Okay, the, uh, the substrate is a niobium doped strontium titanate because all the structures are crystallographically known. They're all single crystal stuff, you know, even though they're thin film. And the bottom substrate is niobium doped strontium titanate. It's conducting. We grow a ferroelectric layer, barium titanate, and then we put <coughs> platinum on top. And so this is it. So it's like a capacitor, and you measure the resistance across it, and it essentially the electrons travel through tunneling in this in this display, okay? And that's what's called tunneling resistance, okay? So now you can see here in the bottom right hand corner, so now what we did we take make the device more compact by adding more and more interfaces. The bottom right hand corner shows you the PEM cross section showing beautifully atomically ordered growth of this all these layer structures. And now what we see is the following. Okay. So this is a typical resistance versus voltage curve. You can sort of see at the increase of voltage, at one volt, the device turns on, it reaches a maximum voltage of about two volts, and then when it turns turn the voltage back, it sort of maintains the hysteresis, and then it switches off at the, at the negative side. You know? And so these are the two memory states that we're going to be using. So there are three types of devices I showed you with added different complexity, and so they all show the three hysteresis curve. The top row is the three hysteresis and what you notice here is the switching voltage and the saturation voltage, the voltage value that you, you saturate, is independent of the number of layers. See, in B, in B, 1.5 is the switching voltage, which is called the coercive voltage. And the saturation voltage is about 1.8 you know, uh, or so. And they're independent of the number of layers, purely dependent by the ferro. Fine. Okay. So essentially, what we find here is that, that uh, that uh, let me kind of quickly go through it. One of the interesting things that we found is the, that a ferroelectric, which is only two unit cell, is able to give us a significant on off ratio of 400% or so. So, this is actually incredibly remarkable for a, an, an outside ferroelectric that just two unit cells can act as a battery and, and can also be ferroelectric. Theoretically, people thought that you, know, you need to have three unit cells. Before a fellow ferroelectric was recognized, but what we're finding is that these two units are good. Okay, now I'm going to, because of the limitation of time, I want to go to my third topic, which is the topic, which is the resisting organic memory, because this is really the power of my talk in a way. So, uh, okay. so, in the system, this work was done by my graduate student, Sri Tosh Goswami. This kid, you know, 
every professor has dreams of the student that's like, you know, like, you know, Joseph's the type of student you want, right? And this kid is of that quality. I mean, just an amazing, amazing student. And this is the program he started in my group. And the nice thing about it is his father works in the Indian Association of Publication of Science, Sri Bhakta Goswami. And he is a kind of an unrecognized, you know, what I call synthetic genius. He makes all these phenomenal molecules with very different So he makes this molecule to the ruthenium centered you know, phenyl azo we call it group act. And so it actually uh, is a three-dimensional molecule. It looks like a three-winged <coughs> butterfly, you know. So imagine three wings uniformly distributed <laughs> across the butterfly. That's what it really looks like. So we took that guy in between uh, a metal electrode. You know, there's an uh, ITO, which is a conducting oxide, which we grow on YSE. Then we put this organic electrode, we just spin it on, and we put a metal electrode on top, okay? And this thing shows the switching character. When you apply it, it looks like it has a structure, but it switches. And what I've shown here is that four volt, the device switches to the, you know, the, you know, basically on state, and has a very strong hysteresis and comes back. And what is shown in the fuzzy line there is actually the, the on off the actual ID for 321 devices that is distribution. And in my mind, I mean, this is one of the world's best organic electronic devices to make. I mean, in fact, in the MRF meeting, this, this paper was published in Nature uh, Materials last week, the first week of December. And in the MRF meeting, at least three major groups in the world said, this is an example of what an organic electronic device should look like. Really so amazing. Now, you can see, the problem with most organic devices is the number of cycles that you can turn them on and off and on and off is very small, typically 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 4 cycles. This device has gone beyond 10 to the 12 cycles and still robust. And we can operate it at 350 Kelvin, which is like uh, almost an eternal, the 80 degree centigrade down to minus 30 degree centigrade without any deterioration at all. This is remarkable. Now, I mean, I'll give you an example. Your, your thumb drive, the silicon device and thumb drive, you can only switch it maximum 10 to the 6 cycles. Okay, give you an example. So it's about a million times more robust than your silicon thumb drive on this Okay. So the <coughs> interesting thing is, from a physics point of view, it's very interesting. What is, what is really remarkable about it, the hero in this is this, the, what's called the azo molecule, the N double bond N molecule. That is the hero of the whole thing. So that is our Amitabh Bachchan in this molecule. So that, the, therefore, when I remove the electron from it, you see I can take one electron, I can take two electrons out of it, and these can point to different, different states. So when, all, when there's no electron removed, you have the zero state, then you get the one state and the two state. So these give you the different conductivity state. So essentially, you can study this using Raman's spectroscopy. And again, this is the first example of an organic device which lends itself so beautifully to understanding the different states that devices have. Okay? So you can tell at point number one, what is the, the valence state or the redox state of the ligand and exactly shows through wrong Just absolutely stunning. And uh, the hysteresis is obtained because of what's called a counter ion, which is used to balance the charge of the lithium. And if I make the counter ion sluggish, you can see that chlorine, which is a light counter ion, they get very broad distribution. PF6 is a little bit heavier, you get narrower, and I go to the you know, PH4B, which is a much heavier counter ion, it becomes a much narrower hysteresis. When we tried to first publish it in nature, the, the referee pointed out the number of so your device is only microsecond and you have large on state resistance and the current that your generating is not detectable easily when you make an arrow device. So what we first noticed was that when you used to see conducting air from here, that he could get the device to switch at very low voltage. So what he did is put some gold nanoparticles on the bottom electrode and the device now switches on. You see the black curve? at half a volt, which is remarkable. So I asked the question, okay, well, is this, maybe it's a local enhancement in the field. So we got our friend at NIST to make small electrodes for us. And this is essentially 100 nanometer diameter electrode. And you can sort of see at 150 millivolts, this device is completely switching on. 
So if you make the electrode even smaller, they'll probably switch on with even smaller uh, voltages. In fact, he went to the ITRS roadmap uh, for the semiconductor roadmap. He looked at what do they want for memory devices. And this device beats every number by a long margin, not even like a little bit. This really beats them by a very long margin. It's really very, very impressive. And this molecule switches now with like 30 nanoseconds, probably faster. And uh, okay, I'm going to speak play through. We can also redesign the molecule so that we can produce a uh, molecule which has got more than two states. So you can sort of see this device, the one in blue, has got one, two, three. And then it's got on the left hand side a four, at least well defined four states which we do with this state. And then this is what we notice when we the lower temperature. We notice that the device is given multiple states. So this is a very interesting problem. What is going on? And for example, here at low temperature, the, this film shows a 60 nanometer film shows three steps. So it takes 16 divided by three, approximately five. So 43 nanometer thing shows eight steps, 43 divided by eight, about five, 64, the nanometer film divided by 12, gives again five. So what is really happening is in these devices, you know, that the five, five represents roughly three units of switching together at the same time. The quantum of three units of the switching. And this has to do with the counter ion. So we said if you make the counter ion lighter, then when one, one layer switches, the other layers may not feel it. And so we went to the uh, fluorine counter ion, which is a low energy, uh, much smaller thing. And now you can see a 12 nanometer thing produces eight steps, and 44 nanometer thing produces 29 steps. And these memories are exactly what you need to replicate your human brain. They're called neuromorphic memories. And it is extremely important in artificial intelligence. You know, this is the kind of memory people are looking for. Okay? So there are other fascinating properties that these material systems exhibit. Like, I mean, it's like one of those materials that, like the perovskites that uh, uh, Sean talked about, it just has so many interesting properties, including fusion electricity, you know, uh, voltage control, photoluminescence, and all this sort of stuff. So it's just the beginning. I think there's a lot more way to go. So I hope I gave you an example or some kind of a, uh, a feeling for the kind of research that we're doing and why we are always in an excited state in, in our institute. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience. Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to detect any signature patterns you know, before the onset of a disease? No, no, you see right now this entire program is uh, at a very early stage. Okay. And the biggest problem is not that you don't have equipment that's sensitive, right? I mean, uh, we have now what are called program exchange mass spectrometers, which are incredibly sensitive. You know, like, they can measure one part per trillion of a molecule, right? In other words, you go to the corner of the room, you open a glass of wine, and I can measure it at this end of the room. You see, that's, that's sensitive, right? So the, that sensitivity is also its problem. Because when you collect the breath from the patient in the hospital, oh, the hospital lab, now we, after I've seen what the hospital end looks like, I don't want to go to any more hospital. I'm really scared. I mean, those air really contaminated. So, we need to, so a lot of work needs to go in terms of how do we collect the breath? How do we avoid contamination? And even the parts that wreck in the breath, you see, you can't collect all of the breath. The initial part of a breath comes from a trachea, this throat part, and that is filled with bacteria, and it doesn't contain the disease information. It's a, you know, what's called the, the, the lung breath, you know? Uh, the, that's the one that you want to get, the actual one that comes from the lungs, and that comes from a different part of the breath. But how do you collect that reproducibly from person to person? There are a lot of challenges ahead. How do you do that? It's a bit complex. Yeah. Uh, deposition is a molecular size level. Okay, yeah. it's very, the deposition is very easy. Very, very molecular size deposition I'm talking about. Yeah. Deposition. So how do you achieve it? Deposition fill the making. Uh, how do you make it fill? We spin it off. Okay. It's actually, huh? it's very easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can make the so uh, have to do the viscosity of the your solvent and spin speed and you can make so we make it anything from you know like 10, 20 nanometers all the way up to about 80, 90 nanometers. Those are the actual range of work. Very good. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, you have a short question. 
So for some information, we'll be available the whole day so we can you know, have a discussion with it. So let us close the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would uh, request Professor Sue to give away my windows to both of you. I request you kindly come on the stage, please. Thank you, Professor Tirumalai, thank you very much. It's gratifying that you're here for some more time. So kindly ask your questions, post questions for you.